Okay, let's get started. Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar from the Johnson Center for Philanthropy. We're very excited to have you join us. Uh, my name is Michael Moody and I uh, hold the Fry Foundation Chair for Family Philanthropy here at the Johnson Center. Um, and I'm very excited to be your moderator for this webinar. Uh, we're particularly excited about this webinar because it's a recreation of a terrific panel that we had at our last, last year's National Summit on Family Philanthropy, which was in San Francisco. Um, and uh, this webinar is a way for us to hopefully allow a lot more people around the country to experience the sorts of in-depth and practically useful discussions that go on at those national summits. Um, and of course, I can't talk about the National Summit without giving a plug for the next one, which will be uh, Save the Date for the next summit in 2019. It's going to take place at the brand new Conrad Hotel in Fort Lauderdale on January 28th and 29th. The theme this time will be Donor Journeys. I'll tell you more about that also at the end of the, the webinar. But for this webinar, we have a, uh, a terrific panel of, of three very experienced folks who are involved in family foundations of different sorts and in different roles. But what they share is really what a lot of and almost all fam philanthropic families share, and that is this dual concern for, for both honoring legacy and for having big impact. Uh, as you know, at times honoring both of those can be quite a challenge um, as social issues and needs and the pathways to impact evolve over time. It becomes difficult to find creative ways to honor cherished family values and legacies while also remaining responsive to the beneficiaries and, to, and adapting to those new ideas and new priorities. So um, our panelists today to talk about this challenge and provide their insight on uh, tackling this sort of perennial family philanthropy uh, um, uh, task uh, are uh, here on this slide. First we're going to hear from uh, Kelly Nolan, who is trustee of the Cerdna Foundation, also a founding board member of the Andrus Family Fund. Uh, next will be Valerie Rockefeller, who is chair and trustee of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Uh, and third, we'll hear from Rick Williams, the CEO of the Sobrato Family Foundation, one of Silicon Valley's um, largest philanthropic organizations. They'll each have 15 minutes to talk, um, and then we will have time after that for uh, them to respond to questions. Uh, now, for those who um, want to ask a question, um, there should be a chat uh, indicator on the bottom left of your screen. Uh, just type in your question and we'll, we'll uh, uh, moderate those on our end. So everybody on the call will be muted and we'll, you'll enter your questions uh, by text. Um, so with all of that uh, logistics, I'm going to turn now first to, to Kelly, uh, Kelly Nolan. And Kelly, uh, thanks again for being part of this. Uh, I just want to ask you to talk about your family foundation recently last year, I believe, celebrated 100 years in existence. Um, and you also have very active programs for engaging the new generations of the Andrews family, as well as the partners in the you know, communities you work. So talk about how you've met the challenges of both nurturing legacy while also adapting to the changing needs in the world and, and, and getting this next generation involved in the foundation. Off to you, Hi. Kelly. Thank you, Michael, um, and it's really great to be a part of this conversation again with my my friends Rick and Valerie. We had a we had a great time last year at the summit, so happy to um, be doing this one more time. Um, I, I wanted to start just succinctly, you know, kind of covering the life and legacy of my great great grandfather. I'm a, a fifth generation Andrus family member, um, and John Emery Andrus is who you see here. Um, and, and he, you know, was a man of uh, a very quirky, interesting guy, let's just say, um, born into pretty, very, very modest means um, on a rural farm right outside of New York City. And, I mean, started in an entrepreneurial mindset from the time he was eight years old and cre creating an, a chicken coop and selling eggs to uh, ending up being a, a lamp lighter, uh, lighting the lamps in the streets of Manhattan, um, and then a, eventually amassing a fortune um, through through a, a number of areas, one being uh, medicine, uh, real estate, and timber. And so the medicine piece is, um, is interesting because he created a, a, a chemical company called the Arlington Chemical Company, and he, he created what were called peptinoids, which was kind of a, a elixir that helped to settle the stomach. I guess you could refer to it or think about it as like a Pepto-Bismol. He was the first person um, in history to figure out a way to make iron soluble for human consumption. So iron supplements that we know today were uh, the invention of, uh, of my great-great-grandfather, and, and he did a number of other things. Um, 
uh, and then real estate, land holdings, timber, and so forth. But, but just kind of even going back to who he was, um, that he was referred to as the multimillionaire strap hanger, and and it's important to mention that because in all of the different roles that he that, um, that he played in his lifetime, and all of the money that he amassed, and the ability he had to you know, to have a driver and to be, you know, taken into the city to, to work or wherever, however means he wished, he would, he would in ch instead choose to ride the train and he would hold the straps of the, tr of the train. Um, and so he became known as the multimillionaire strap hanger because he believed and he liked very much being with the people. He wanted to be an, an accessible and be um, a part of the communities and the people. A part of his legacy um, was a quote that that he once said about believing very much in opportunity for youth and rest for old age. And so there are two legacy facilities that still exist today, um, decades later. Uh, one founded in 1928 is an Andrus Children's Center, which is this is actually the house that his wife grew up in, and then there's a whole campus behind that that is now a residential treatment center for, for kids that struggle in, in typical um, situations, and then, um, and then a senior care community um, at Anderson Hudson. And so those legacy homes are very much steeped in kind of who he was and, and keeping his memory alive and honoring his legacy. And so I just wanted to kind of paint the picture of who he was and then think about how the heck do you thread that through um, over a hundred years? How do I, as a steward of his philanthropy, think about that legacy, not ever having met the man, never uh, having any documentation of where he specifically said, this is what I want my family to do with our philanthropy. Um, and so how does that thread through? Um, and so it's, it, it, it does show up. And so in today, fast forward, this is Certainas mission. Um, Certainas mission is, is, has evolved over time, um, and, and we continue to examine this language and evolve it more explicitly um, to, to, to be more impactful grant makers. So we believe very much in social justice, and we believe in, in you know, approaching it in, with three different programmatic strategies. Um, but how the legacy shows up, to me it's reflected in values. So how could I get to know who this man was? And so there, were, there was a book written about my great-great-grandfather, um, which definitely illuminated and brought to life who he was. There were stories that I, I learned about him and anecdotes and artifacts and, and so on. And, and, and as I've gotten to know him over the time I've served in the family philanthropy, I started to see that connection, that thread, and that through line of how legacy shows up in service of impact, in service of our mission. So he believed, actually, um, because of the way he had to, to really build his wealth from nothing, um, he, he was a very efficient, kind of thrifty, uh, frugal businessman. And he kind of believed, as he be began into a philanthropic journey, that you could manage philanthropy the same way as a business venture. And so he paid a lot of attention to the, the investments in growing the endowment, which it has done pretty successfully over 100 years. Um, and, and then we pay attention to it in how we are efficient with the resources and tools that we're using in terms of in service of impact. So thinking about um, how we're leveraging all of our assets well beyond grant making, looking at impact investing, looking at our human capital as well as our financial capital and how we can leverage that and be efficient with all of those things in service of impact. The humility piece is, is pretty clear in terms of his name um, being Andrus. And, you know, when he established the foundation, he was not about his name in lights. So he flipped the name backwards and spelled, you know, and spelled it and called it Serdna, which it is, I have to now tell this every time I go <laughs> anywhere to, to talk about it because it's a little strange. But, you know, how did the humility, how does it show up now in our in our role as, found, as, as a foundation, as a funder, is, is it shows up in trying to name ourselves and in, in being committed to being a learning organization. And when you say you're a learning organization after 100 years of stewardship, you are, you are automatically saying that, you know, we're humble. We don't know everything. We need to pay attention to the power dynamics that exist within our foundation, between board and staff, 
if we're going to have honest conversations around failure, around really um, digging into what works, what doesn't, what we need to tweak, and building a, a more healthy and effective strategy, we have to have we have to diminish those power dynamics so staff and board can have those safe spaces to talk about that. And it, that trickles down, you know, into how staff, I believe, show up externally. So when you are diffusing power dynamics internally in a humble way, in a learning kind of a mindset together on this journey, I really do believe, and I have seen it in practice, that your program people or the people that you are deploying into the field to work with the partners and the grassroots organizations and the communities are showing up in humble ways. They're showing up and modeling that learning and partnership behavior. The piece that did need to change for CERDNA over time was this branding um, piece. And, and that was kind of a sounding board that, you know, I, I, I got on, uh, you know, when I joined the board about nine years ago because the third and the fourth generation, this, this thing around modesty was so big that nobody ever wanted any attribution to CERDNA in anything that we did. But what, I, what myself and some others helped the foundation see and the board see was that actually there are moments in time when leveraging your brand, leveraging the foundation's name can actually be impactful in service of your mission, in service of the work, not in a self-congratulatory way. And so this, this leverage, this humility had to adjust and adapt. So if we were going to be really effective in our roles and bring other peer funders to the table and, get, um, you know, and, and make statements about the, the, the state of uh, you know, affairs and, and communities and, the, and issues that we're addressing, in some cases leveraging our voice and our brand was really important. Uh, accessibility. Um, there was a great quote my, my great-great-grandfather said in this book that said, quote, he, that he believed he could, quote, get more useful information from hearing the views of the common people than from the other class. And that to me really resonated about how we now show up and think about being proximate, as Brian Stevenson would say. How do we be proximate? How do we truly understand and, and listen to the views of those that we're serving or, or trying to help in some way and lift up? Um, how are we developing authentic partnerships and remaining accessible to, to those partners and, and the people in the, in the communities to truly understand and get smarter and sharper at what we're doing and what we're trying to measure? Um, the empathy and compassion piece to me is, a, is embodies who he was. He, he stated, um, in New York, we always have the poor with us. It's depressing. It shouldn't be. There should be efficient ways of helping many of these people, and the rest of my life is going to be devoted to that end. And what I took from that was this, this value of real compassion. Um, and as I think about empathy, to me empathy is you can only have empathy if you truly understand communities, if you truly understand the systems that are, are holding certain audiences and populations back. And so empathy to me is it, it connects to our learning and to that deep understanding and getting proximate. It connects to having a compassion for a long-term commitment to social justice. And it really connects to, you know, this being a long-term play, but really trying to empower communities to, to be leaders themselves, to really own, own their futures and have this be sustainable. Um, and, and, I, and I just feel like he's, he's embodied that and that has thread through to some of the ways that we, we believe in our commitments and, our, and continue to have compassion and empathy for, for some of the um, constituents that we're, we're working with. And finally, uh, I'll end um, with family. Um, this was, uh, you know, a value of him. He belie believed that duty began with a man's family. He had a, we, had a, we have a very large family. He had nine children, uh, eight of which, uh, you know, went on to, to uh, build their own family branches. And today there's nearly 500 extended family members that are living in uh, that are not are include descendants but also spouses and partners and adopted children and, and we, we include all of that in our in our family so we, we have a large large family and he really was passionate about that and that value you know kind of finally played out in 2000 when the fourth gen decided to launch a family philanthropy program um, and and we have three components of that the Andrus family fund 
a youth program for teenagers and a board experiential training, which is almost a junior board for 18 to 24 year olds. And, and all three of these, particularly the youth programs, AFF is its own kind of funder in its own in its own right. Um, they they fund in foster care and juvenile justice. Um, and we learn from AFF. CERDNA and AFF are, are constantly sharing and learning materials. But the, the junior programs are something where we really, we really upgraded the curriculum to, to, to build in a, a, a lessons around social justice, lessons around racial equity, power and privilege, to truly understand that. But the key takeaway I just wanted to, to share here is that his value around family wasn't in succession planning. It wasn't in that my, he believed his family should be a part of the philanthropy or the foundation. It actually was just kind of instilling um, the values of philanthropy, planting seeds where, where young people in our family can find their own identities in this space, and, and maybe there's something that they show up and, and do in their lifetime that, that is philanthropic. And if it's serving on the board, great, but if you lead with that when you're thinking about next-gen engagement, you fall short. You fall short of, of really deep, authentic learning and allowing for individual leadership and identity to be formed. And, and so that's, um, that's really key. And this was uh, evident to me in an email I got yesterday from a sixth generation family member who's graduating from college this year. And she's participated in all of these youth programs. And she says, I feel really at home and excited about this type of work alongside my interests in public health and women's health. When I speak about family philanthropy and next-gen next gen work, I feel a sort of excitement and pride. And to me, there's a seed there. There's something that's been inspired and planted. And if she goes on to serve on, on the boards, wonderful. But if she goes on to be a steward in other ways in her community and in different sectors of the world, you know, even better. Um, and so that's, re that's really important. I will um, finish with this last quote which to me was the closest version I could find of a, of a donor legacy statement, so to speak. Um, and this was something, again, that came from we were, we were lucky to have an autobiography written um, about John Andrus. And life's voyage, life's, life's voyage, life's journey, life's struggles are all failures if they do not from day to day produce something that makes the lives of others sweeter, nobler, and better. And I think the takeaway here for me is if you think about legacy and you think about impact, legacy is not, I, I, not what you leave behind. It actually is how you're living now. And, and I think he thought of it that way, and I think that we think of it that way, um, uh, of really showing up in the best way possible, bringing your, your full values, your full self to this work, um, and being true, authentic partners in this, in this effort, um, and being a learning organization and constantly checking yourself and owning your mistakes and trying to get better. Great. Thanks so much, Kelly. It's such a powerful story. And I think, uh, I think it's, it's really interesting to see uh, just how sort of forward thinking he was about many of these issues that we now talk about in the field of philanthropy as, as current issues he was thinking about 100 years ago. Uh, yeah. And I think that's a really powerful, uh, powerful story. I think it's also amazing that you were exactly 15 minutes to the second. Uh, and that's a <laughs> skill that, uh, that you have that I clearly don't have. I wish I did. Um, oh. We're going to before we turn on, I just want to encourage everybody on the, uh, on the call that remember that we are going to have time for some Q&A after all three presenters, um, and that's going to be done through the website through you typing in your questions. So be thinking of questions. Feel free to type in a question at any point, uh, and we'll try to get the, to that at the end. So we turn now um, to Valerie Rockefeller. Um, and uh, Valerie, of course, you, you also come from a, from a family with a very long and storied uh, philanthropic legacy. Um, and some people might think of that as sort of a, a great weight that you and your family have to carry in your philanthropy. But how do you uh, talk about how you feel about a legacy maybe in a more positive light, perhaps as something that can inform and inspire more creative and effective giving by later generations like you? Um, and how does legacy show up in your giving or in, even in, in the impact investing work that you're uh, getting very well known for now in the Rockefeller Brothers Fund? So Valerie, up to you. Thank you, and it is great to be together again, even if virtually. And I appreciate this opportunity and everyone um, who has who has 
called in or is participating in this. I have to say Kelly has put a lot of pressure on me by not only being exactly 15 minutes, but by also pointing out that her family was humble enough not to put their name on everything. And then sitting here looking at Rockefeller, everything around me, <laughs> we, I'd like to think, are humble in our grant making and our approach, but clearly the name thing, not so much. So I um, will start off with a quotation also like Kelly, and this is what I sort of consider our family motto, which came from John D. Rockefeller Jr., and here's what he said. I believe in the supreme worth of the individual and his right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I believe that every right implies a responsibility, every opportunity and obligation, every possession a duty. And this is, um, this is written in front of Rockefeller Center. It's a very public quotation, and there are mixed reactions to it in our family because some, of the, some people interpret it as the, the guilt motto, right? You know, speaking of the weight of a legacy that, okay, you can enjoy this possession, but it means that you have an obligation to someone else or, you know, this opportunity is wonderful, but think about the responsibility you have to use it for the benefit of others. I have not seen it that way. I think everyone, whether you're born into great wealth or not, you know, has obligations and duties and responsibilities based on what they have been given. So I have not myself felt it as a weight. I've really felt it more as an opportunity in my life. I will say that I ended up growing up in West Virginia where Rockefeller in general is not so popular and wealth is often uh, you know, create suspicion more than anything else. And so I think I had a complicated uh, relationship maybe with the family name that way, but not so much with the legacy because I found so much to be proud of. There had been history of tensions with unions and with minors and, and all that, which I interpreted differently in West Virginia. But there also had been this great family legacy of philanthropy, which really started from the beginning with John D. Rockefeller Sr. He did not suffer from guilt, by the way, because he really thought that his um, that it was God that enabled him to create wealth and that it was for the benefit of God that he gave that wealth back. So I think he was quite morally serene, actually, because he didn't... Uh, he never felt that he was doing anything wrong. He really felt that he was acting on God's will. And that is probably pretty, you know, ethically convenient for him to think of it that way. But I will say he did have moral consistency as well because he tithed, gave 10% of his income to the Baptist church, even when he was dirt poor, when he was first making money and he would clean up in the church and do everything he could to be part of that community. So I, I do have pride in that part of the legacy. There's another problematic name sitting here looking at this Rockefeller Brothers Fund slide. You will see there is, in fact, a sister there. So I always feel like I need to explain that. So that is Babs Rockefeller, who's there in the middle. And she was the old, eldest child as well as the only daughter of John D. Rockefeller Jr. and Abby Aldrich Rockefeller, who was a huge force in our family. She did end up joining the RBF board in 1954 and was a trustee until she died 22 years later. And her daughter, Abby, was the first woman who chaired the board. So Abby is a fourth-generation member of the family. I'm a fifth-generation member of the family, but important to note, a second woman to be leading the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. And um, so we just held on to the name, however, though, because, in fact, when the RBF was founded in 1940, it was, um, it was the brothers in the family. Babs, the one you see sitting there, she looks quite demure, but she was really quite a rebel and smoked and drank and drove fast and all these things that were not socially acceptable in her family. So she was a bit of a rebel and came into it later. So those brothers that you see sitting there are the ones who did get together on Sunday afternoons, and they are the ones who, who wanted to coordinate their philanthropy. They were getting so many appeals that they thought they weren't being very strategic in the way that they um, that they were passing the money out. And so the, the office has just become more and more strategic over time. So now you can see we have our, our general mission is the just, sustainable, and peaceful world. And then the way we do that is by three program areas, democratic practice, sustainable development, and peace building. Again, this is part of the family legacy in the sense that if, the, if you look at the work of the Rockefeller family over time, which has changed generation to generation, I think you would find these themes here, that everyone should have a voice in our democracy, that um, the environment is something that needs to be protected and accessible for all and by all, 
and then peace building is also to be global in the work that you're doing and try to address the drivers of conflicts to make people have a more just and prosperous life, which will reduce the, the likelihood of, contact, of conflict. So this concept of pivotal, pivotal places are, is how we choose where we work. Everything we do in the United States, we do overseas, except for in China, to be honest, where democratic practice does not go over very well. So there we, we emphasize more the environmental health part of our work. But part of the humility that, that I feel in our grant making is that if we are working on investigative journalism in the Western Balkans, we're also funding investigative journalism in the United States. And if we are working on how to um, cultivate corporate responsibility in China, we're doing the exact same thing in the United States. If we're working on giving women more of a voice in Egypt, we're doing the exact same kind of work in the United States. So we really do see lessons as transferring back and forth in informing each other. So the arts and culture program we have in New York is partially uh, supported through doing artist residencies, again, giving access in, at, a, at a family property that we have, which is a nonprofit conference center. And so not only do artists come and live on this family property where, where uh, family members no longer live, it's almost all been turned over to the public. There is public access. There's a community school garden where people, where local students come in. And so this, this is an example of a property that has been turned over to nonprofit work. If any of you ever want to do a conference here, please go on our website, www.rbf.org. It's less than an hour away from New York City. And if you fit the sort of program guidelines, often we'll even help support the, uh, support the conference. So that's the Botanico Center that we, that's down there. This is how we look at the, um, how we organize our program areas, and they are in our pivotal places that we work. We try to combine these. So for example, we would try to do a grant that perhaps would be putting solar panels in an underserved community while, where we're also working with local groups. We are always trying to cultivate local civic society as much as we can and build relationships with them and bring them in touch. It is remarkable as a grant maker that you can often know what's happening, even if it's halfway around the world, uh, in a country that they are so um, immersed in the work that they're doing and often so under-resourced that they don't know what each other are doing. So these are the type of connections that we try to make. Um, so I'm going to focus a little bit on climate change because it is a lot of the work we do. I will get to the impact investing in a minute, but I'm just going to keep going through the slideshow while I'm working on it. So in the beginning, we had, um, <laughs> I like to say, a lot more money and a lot fewer Rockefellers. So the way that the, 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 the earlier generations of our family would often buy property and then turn it over to be a public park or something like that or work to restore um, properties that, you know, or buildings even that there would be public access to. So there was also the conservation. Lawrence Rockefeller is there on the left, and he really got into sort of ecotourism and worked around the world developing resorts that were green, which was pretty impressive because this was decades and decades ago that he was thinking that way. He was really very much a businessman and a great investor. So long before any of us talked about impact investing, he was doing that kind of work. And then the RBF shifted more into working on ecology and how to preserve um, biodiversity and other, other ways of trying to you know, conserve the environment. Now the RBF is primarily focused on climate change. It's important for me to say that I, in speaking for the RBF, I'm involved with some other family organizations that do other work. But environmentalism is, I think, a common thread in our family. That's what most people in the family are are uh, focused on, and that is a real bond for us. We do family meetings also every year, and we report on our philanthropic work, and it's amazing the number of reports that are given about various environmental issues. Now what the Rockefeller Brothers Fund focuses on is climate change. So in our grant making, there's a big public education component of that. We also had been trying to, to work at the federal level on policy change. We had sort of given up on that in some ways after Kyoto and had begun to focus more on regional efforts and state and lo local efforts and also obviously internationally. 
I actually am going on a trip next month out to the Pacific Northwest to Vancouver and Seattle and San Francisco because there's just so much happening there that is very encouraging, even though there's, you know, there are a lot of challenges now with the current federal government. And I am not just saying this about Trump, although he's obviously a major obstacle. Congress has really been deadlocked and behind on this issue. We are the only country that has not signed the Paris Accords at this point. So we try to do some policy advocacy and a lot of public education work, from supporting green architecture to helping towns and cities that want to do, um, you know, to want to take lessons from other places and try to green themselves. And, of course, the Mission Align Investing, which I promise still to get back to, but first, I can't help it. The last trip that I went on was even more exciting, and this was to Antarctica which is a joint trip that I took with a few other trustees in Stephen Heinz, our president, last month, um, along with the Nature Conservancy. And so it was there were a group of people. Some of it was trustees from the two organizations, but there were also a lot of other people on the trip who either signed up because it was a climate change featured um, Cruise is in effect what it is because it's mainly travel when you get down to Ant when you go down to Antarctica. So we had lectures on board, you know, from what was happening with the glaciers and the penguins to you know what we can do on a policy level and the involvement of the private sector on the ship. So public education is a big part of our work, but we also were very conscious of the fact that going to Antarctica is in fact has a massive climate impact. So just to say that we do a lot of carbon offsets and that kind of thing to, to balance out what we're trying to do. What we learned on the trip from Stephen Heinz was that he had gone and done some research at the Archive Center, and we always knew there was this mysterious stuffed penguin that had ended up sort of floating around in the family places and ended up in the school superintendent's office in Tarrytown, New York, is where it is now. And the story of the penguin, in fact, was that this admirable, admirable bird who had done a lot of exploration in Antarctica had sent it as a thank you gift to John D. Rockefeller, Jr., who, and I did not know any of this part of the history, had been a very early funder of Admiral Byrd's. And, um, and so you can see there on this map that, that there was even a Rockefeller Plateau named after him in some mountains, which I like to think was pretty high-impact grant-making that John D. Rockefeller Jr. did to get the mountains named after him. We never get that sort of recognition anymore, but I think the public education part of the trip in using what we learned in Antarctica about how fragile it is there and about the need for us to marshal all of our resources to fight climate change, you know, is a different kind of performance indicator, I suppose. Back to the humility question. One thing that I loved is when you look at how they communicated with each other and the type of grant making that John D. Jr. did, he really formed a personal relationship with Admiral Byrd. And looking at the um, down here when he talks about Byrd, he had other funders of his expeditions, obviously. J John D. Rockefeller Jr. had given $150,000. But when he was thinking about these mountains that he discovered and whether he wanted what, you know, after whom he was going to name them, which much have been a high pressure to decision, what he did end up writing was that he ended up choosing Junior because he's a man with great, who, with his great power stands for progress, whose great power stands for progress, steady as a rock in the chaos and turmoil of life. So his character and name both reminded me of those rocky peaks sticking their heads above the snow. It occurred to me that his real austere life is as a little known, is as little known generally as those peaks that man has never, uh, had never before looked upon. So again, a tribute to his, you might think it's a tribute to his ego that he named the mountains after them, but in fact, I think he was recognizing that Junior was quite a humble man, and they did have quite a lovely relationship, as you can he see here from just like the fact of seeing a radiogram is pretty awesome. But then you see down here that they sent nice notes to each other about Thanksgiving Day, I'm thinking of you, and that this is a personal connection that we had between us. I just think this is a really important part of the Rockefeller legacy, is choosing great partners and then really investing in those relationships. I also just love this one. Um, this is more material that, that Stephen Hines, our president, found at the Rockefeller Archive Center that Junior went through, and I call this hands-on grant making and, uh, and management, that he went through and really put his personal stamp on everything. Someone else did the drafting for him, but he really took personal concern in everything that he did. So the mission-aligned part of what we're doing now is 
in some ways the most impactful grant making we've done and in some ways feels I, or, you know, people have discussed, d described it as quite ironic that all of the money came from oil, and the and the family money was really put into primarily into the into the endowments of these various family organizations, and funding work that in climate change for the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Yet, as you know, we only give away five percent of our assets through our grant making. So, 95 percent of our assets were. Um, not being used as effectively as they could have been, and, and some of them even, we are at 7.7% of our assets were in fossil fuels, were directly undermining the work that we do. So we got interested in, in uh, mission-aligned investing is how we describe it more internally. Um, I would say about over a decade ago, and it took us five to seven years before we could really enact this you know, really realize our vision, I would say, because it is a pretty long process in terms of figuring out what you have, and especially because our endowment was um, invested in commingled funds. It is hard to pull out what you have, even to know what's there, much less to, you know, figure out how to, to, to sell off those investments and reinvest in clean energy or other investments that are more aligned with our values and our mission. We did end up having to sort of change the composition of our investment committee. We ended up outsourcing our investing. Then we ended up switching investment offices. I'd be happy to talk through more of this um, uh, process with anyone who wants to because it is quite involved. But we did get to a place where we hired Perella Weinberg. Uh, they have a Perella Weinberg Partners. They have a OCO service, outsourced chief investment office service called Agility. And they really came in as real thought partners of ours and figuring out how we could not only, um, you know, invest our own money in ways that were supportive, you know, in ways that were supportive of our grant making, but also how we could do the public education part of our mission. They've been great about helping us speak at conferences. We put everything we can up on our website, including the type of investments we make and the ways we categorize them. We try to be very strict with the definitions because we never want to mislead in terms of uh, greenwashing, the saying you're doing something that you're not really. And part of the double challenge for our, for our investment committee is that we are not willing to do concessionary investments. We believe in our grant making and we want to keep our endowment growing so that we can pass it on to, to future generations. This is part of our legacy is that we do have generational neutrality that you know, future generations of Rockefellers and the half of the board that are outside experts, uh, trustees, will have, you know, the same capacity, even greater, to address the challenges of their time. So I will um, stop with that. I also could talk a little bit more about proxy voting, which is something else that we are uh, doing now. So we haven't just divested from fossil fuels and reinvested, but we are also getting more and more involved in voting our proxies. But I hope I haven't been keeping track of my own time. I hope that I am okay, but I, You're will, good. I will stop there. Thank you. That's great. Thanks so much, Valerie. I love the, uh, the idea you brought up at the end, the generational neutrality. I think it's a really interesting uh, idea I, I, uh, um, for, for everybody, really. Um, and we, can, we, uh, we also, uh, once again, reminder to everybody that if you have questions, please be typing those in. You can either designate them for individuals, or you can uh, just ask a general question for, uh, for any of the panelists to respond to. Um, and there will also be potentially be time for you to talk a bit more about uh, proxy voting if you want to, Valerie, at the end. Um, so we turn now uh, to Rick Williams. Um, and, uh, and Rick, obviously you represent a newer foundation than, than both Kelly and, and Valerie, um, but it's a foundation that has very ambitious plans, both uh, for impact and for establishing a legacy in Silicon Valley and elsewhere. So what, why has it been important uh, for you to capture the legacy and the intent statements of the original founders, and, and how have you done this while also ensuring that you continue to respond to those current and changing needs of the organizations and issues that, that you and they want to support? So over to you, Rick. Great. Well, th thank you, Michael. And um, Kelly and Valerie, I, I enjoy doing this with you. I, I think each of you tee up elements that we could go on the road and talk about in, in depth in a lot of different ways. It's, it's the, the transition from these institutional iconic organizations and foundations to a, a uh, young, young adult, as we are a 20-year-old uh, foundation, um, 
just shows that what happens if you're thoughtful, if you're deliberate and you're mindful about um, the path that you're on. So let me quickly step through. This first picture you have on the screen is, is really important. So the Sobrato Family Foundation is a 21-year-old organization that was started by one of the original commercial real estate developers in Silicon Valley. And as they happened to say um, they were in the right place at the right time, transitioning from a um, very successful John Sr., um, the patriarch of the family currently is the, the little uh, boy in the middle, and his parents um, are, are on either of his side. His dad was an a, uh, uh, immigrant to the country and ran a, a successful uh, restaurant establishment in San Francisco. It was actually quite large, and uh, my understanding was it took up a full city block. Um, when he passed, um, John Sr.'s mom, Anne, um, tried to take that over and was um, – and, and was realizing that it was very daunting for her to do it by herself. During Earlier in time while he was still alive, um, she had the idea and they worked together to um, buy some land down in the South Bay to grow crops and stuff that they would use in the restaurant. Well, upon deciding to get out of the restaurant building uh, business, she uh, sold that land and realized that for that one sale, she made more than they were making on an annual basis in the restaurant and decided very early on that she was going to be in the real estate business. So um, they talk about the, the, you know, the, legacy, the, the legacy and the, and the uh, titans of Silicon Valley um, and Sobrato as being at that era, um, being one of the major uh, real estate developers is an important story that some point we're trying to figure out how to tell and it's part of the legacy that we carry forward so that's that's the piece there so um, granny Anna, as she was known was a force in the valley and and really set up john senior to take to come into the real estate business and be as i said one of the original um, real estate uh, developers here most of the some of the iconic companies you know from silicon valley including apple have are currently in or have been in a Sobrato building. Uh, Sobrato is four generations that have lived and worked in the Valley, and they know that they have greatly benefited from the region's growth. But what makes them very special and, and the legacy that runs through um, the work we're doing now and how they carry themselves is that they know very well and firsthand by being here and being a place-based organization that far too many residents do not have full access to the opportunities and the quality of life that they have. And so they are determined to make this a place that works for everybody. And that's kind of the, the thread that runs through um, all of our conversations, all of our work, is how can we make Silicon Valley a place of opportunity for all of its residents. Um, for over, so for over 20 years, we have focused on building strong nonprofits um, and having those partners be accessible and available to the community at large. We do that by offering general operating support grants, by doing capacity building programs. We actually are offering one uh, today on risk, risk management, helping under nonprofits know how to take um, curated and thoughtful risks to, to attack these ever-increasing challenges. We also do that by offering uh, first-class office space. So we provide 74 uh, nonprofit organizations uh, free rent-free space that enables them to stay in a market where um, square foot rents are about four to five to nine dollars, depending on where you want to be. So, we that is our way again to make sure that everyone has opportunity, everyone is successful. We finally, though, we also promote high quality education, and we also promote. Um, um, and I, I was got so into talking, I wasn't advancing my slides. So currently you also see our current board um, on, on this current slide. That's the current board of the foundation. It actually is short of two. We have now added the fourth generation. Um, so we have um, our first, uh, fourth generation. They are the grandsons of, of the eldest son of John and Sue Sobrato. Um, and they came on. You have to be 25 to, to uh, be eligible to come on the board. So they have now joined the board of, of directors. 
and then this is what I was going to right now. In, in short order, um, we, we focus on making great schools accessible. We focus on uh, helping folks get into uh, career, uh, uh, career opportunities uh, and, and uh, taking care of them, their selves economically. Um, we focus on building great nonprofits, as I talked about. And a lot of our work right now is focused on making sure that being an English learner is not a barrier to, to academic success. And we have a very large program that focuses on that. It's actually our only program that has gone outside of Silicon Valley. It is now a statewide program. So in sum, before I get to the donor intent part, is in essence, we're a multi-generational family that has grown up in the Valley. And we're in a, just, we take very much our responsibility that we are in a unique position to, to stand up and, and talk about um, what's often overlooked. We want to talk about the success of the Valley, but we're, we feel we're in a unique position to talk about the inequities that exist here. And um, I think we have the standing to do that because we've grown up here, we've been here, and I think that has given us a lot of opportunity to make change. So then donor intent and, and why that is so important. As you know, compared to uh, what you heard from Kelly and Valerie, I said we're very young. So donor intent and being mindful of that is, very, is critical to who we are. Um, we have hundreds of millions of dollars in assets, and as some people heard that, that saw us do this before, um, when, when, as John says, when his will matures, um, we will be 10 times larger than we are right now. So they are, they are focused, laser focused on the fact that we have to figure this out and get it right now so that the legacy, the, the engagement, the type of impact, the way we measure it, the way we do our work is happening during what we um, um, call this piloting phase that we're in right now is, is prepared, prepares us for, for when we are a significantly, significantly larger uh, organization. So the purpose of our donor intent is to keep the family together. The number one mission of the of all of our work and the number one mission of the, of the family is to is to have the have the foundation and the philanthropic endeavors hold the family together and they do it together through a shared sense of passion, a shared sense of vision. Um, we their goal, as John will say, his goal is to ensure that the foundation and its philanthropy remains relevant to future generations, and and that is measured by their willingness to give money to that, to to invest part of their philanthropic wealth back into the foundation so we can do community good. I wanted to read um, real quick a, the, a sentence from um, our donor statement. So in every board book, we have um, – a donor, the founder's donor. We learned over time that we needed to get this stuff documented, and so we did, and I'll talk about that on the next slide, but it's, it was very important for us to, to do that um, while John was still alive. We didn't get, uh, we did, weren't able to do that or didn't have that foresight for Granny Ann, but we did for John, and he starts this letter by saying, the work of the foundation should continue to build our family's legacy and promote our philanthropy so that we are remembered for our contributions and inspire others to give back by our example. And that's, what, that's kind of the, how we open every meeting. Every board book I put together, that is this opening statement so that it, it is a reminder of what we're doing and that we're trying to lead by example. The foundation is set up. The other way that donor intent has been trying to uh, handle is that notion of keeping everyone together We've set up the foundation as a vehicle for their collective giving, but each family member has their own uh, donor advised funds at the local community foundation so they can do their own um, uh, personal giving. And that, has, that, that structure, we believe, is going to hold us in good stead and, and not have a split so that they can go off and do, we have family members working on sustainable food, we have them working on health and overseas and, and, and educational pursuits that are outside of our geographic area. They can do that through their DAF, and then they come together collectively to talk about the work of the foundation that I, I described earlier. The, the other thing I wanted to mention, um, and then talk about the governance and leg legacy uh, real quick, but the other thing I wanted to remember that's really important for us and has really anchored us is 
is the expectation of the family. So what what the family has done, and, and I think most of you know that we are giving pledge signers. So both John Senior and John Michael um, have signed it, and the other uh, the daughters will sign it as well um, in the foreseeable future. Um, are have signed the giving pledge, and that was again a statement by them to the community that they are determined and committed to um, giving their wealth back to the community that, that benefited them so greatly. The other thing, though, what's inherent in the statement on this slide is that they have an expectation of each Sobrato family member that at, that at least half of your, of your wealth will, be, will go back to the community, that you will give it away philanthropically. And they've had those conversations so that every child coming up um, knows that there is an expectation that half of your wealth goes back. The family has taken care of itself so that they know um, every child born alive right now is a partner in the real estate business. And so it's from the family standpoint, they will be taken care of. Therefore, um, half, of their, half of their wealth can go back to the community. So that expectation also is part of the legacy that started with Granny Ann and her expectation of taking John Sr. out and making him do charitable work and moves, continues to move through the current, uh, uh, the current family. And then I'm trying to be really mindful at times so we can get to, to questions. Um, so how do, we, how do we document our donor intent? Um, we, we went and went on a tour and talked to a lot of our family colleagues about how they did it and what, and what they did and what they wished they had done. Um, and we heard loudly and clearly that you need to, um, it, even if it's painful, which it was, <laughs> you need to get your, your, your patriarch and matriarch, in this case John and Sue, to sit down and just and talk about what their life experience was, why philanthropy is important, what they want uh, the future generations to remember. As, as Kelly so eloquently say, stay, said, future generations will not know John. And, and we learned, we literally listened to what does that mean to them. So we have done two things. We have, we have the founder intent document that um, I, I just read a piece from. We also had John also, we got him to write a personal letter uh, to, to the family at large that goes into more depth about his personal convictions around philanthropy. And so that is also um, in the board book that we have every month so everyone can see that. And then finally, and this was the most painful process, but it turned out to be a wonderful piece, is that we uh, videotaped. Um, we got John and Sue on videotape um, talking about the family history and the legacy. Um, and we believe that that mode of, of translation will, will be more adaptable to the future generations than, than uh, the books that, that have been done. And we actually toyed with that, and, and we thought that it's more likely to get the next generation to sit down and watch this video. And it's a very compelling video. We got the opportunity to roll out pieces of it at our 20th anniversary event, and it was quite compelling and well-received. Well so that's how we documented it. I think in, um, in closing, um, so we can get to, to questions, I think in closing I would say that um, the thing that has brought this to life is that we have been living governance and legacy in everything that we do. It, we have been, I, I've been here five years now, I would say we've been talking about governance and legacy in a real earnest and thoughtful way for the last three years and it's still, it's still continuing, it's a work in progress. It runs through our conversation, it runs through conversations about how we bring on the fourth generation which we now have. It runs through conversations about how we brought on our uh, non-family board members, which we now have. And that was, if we're going to do this, if we're going to grow, how can we learn? How can we bring on the right expertise? So having the, having the, leg the lens of, of the, the legacy, the donor intent, uh, has opened up opportunities for us to ask ourselves questions. Who do we need on our board? Are we, are we comfortable expanding that? How are we going to bring in the next generation? What, what is their role going to be? And so we have been able to do a, a number of things under the guise of the donor intent that I don't think we would have been able to do otherwise. And I think that um, it has allowed us to clarify our purpose, it's allowed us to clarify our grant making, and it's allowed us to um, 
at evaluation staff. That wasn't a, a focus um, early on. So there's things that if you stay true to it, and I think you heard that in Kelly and Valerie's piece, they straight, stay true to where the family was coming from and where the family is going, it then opens you up to being able to look at your operations in a real, in a real clear-eyed way. And I think that I'll, I'll end with that um, um, so we can go to questions. Thank you. Terrific. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Rick. I think it's really uh, your story is really fascinating um, in, in the sense of, of recognizing, and I think it's sort of instructive for others, uh, recognizing the importance of, of of documenting that legacy, or I mean, that documenting that intent in a way that then can um, be useful but also adaptable by pre, by by later generations. Um, and even though that's a painful process, and I think a lot of families see it as a kind of a painful process. Um, it's, uh, it's the, the, the benefits of going through it uh, can be tremendous um, going forward. So, so we have some questions here. I'm going to encourage people again to, um, to type in questions if you have them. We won't be able to get to all of them, I'm sure. But um, just to get started on the questions, Kelly, the first one will be to you. Um, so how do you present the opportunities or even provide ongoing foundation information to the younger generations in a welcoming, approachable, and exciting way? Uh, thanks for the question, Anne. And um, you know, really quick, so we can we can kind of get as many questions in as possible. I, I think leading leading that the list that I have is the personal connection. I find that I spend personal time um, chairing the family program that we have. I, I spend a lot of time with exchanges with our next generation, with connecting them to um, thought leaders in the field on our staff of, of top, around topics or issues that they may be passionate about. We track a lot of that, the, the passion areas and the interest areas in a database. We use Salesforce because our family is so large, but, but even making notations of what some of your younger family members are interested in, what they're studying, you know, is a, is a really wonderful way to connect them with meaningful, relevant information. Um, we have an, a newsletter that gets printed um, as well as digital, so uh, that goes out that actually family um, contributes uh, two, so their stories, their service trips, whatever. Um, we illuminate a lot of them, have them be their own writers and um, interviewers and so forth, as well as illuminate some of the things going on in the philanthropies. Um, and then more and more what I'm seeing and I'm really excited about are speaking opportunities. I've been um, extending invitations and, and uh, getting opportunities for our sixth generation uh, young people to come in um, different panel discussions or plenary sessions with me or with other uh, certain folk to, to actually sh talk about their personal story and, and to have a 20-year-old or an 18-year-old um, talk about that, the people are really interested in what they have to say and how it's impacted them. But I, I would emphasize just that, that personal connection, there's nothing like it, just having that mentor. Great. Thanks a lot, Kelly. Uh, um, uh, moving to, uh, again, we want to try to get as many questions as we can. So moving to a question for Rick. Um, what specific areas of risk management does the Sobrato Foundation focus on? In it? You, you mentioned risk management work with nonprofits. And what, what specific areas do you work in in that? And I guess I'll add to the question uh, about, you know, does that focus on risk management work with nonprofits have something to do with the, with the risk management approach of the founding intent and founding donors? Uh, that's a that's a great question. Um, so we just a little context. So we offer as one of our capacity building programs ongoing speaker series um, that we make available to any nonprofit. Don't have to be grantees of ours. Um, and we either do uh, speaker series or we bring in uh, speakers from across the country, or we do small cohorts of 10 to 18 folks that are working on a, a particular topic. So. Uh, this one I mentioned is, is today, um, we're doing a, a conversation with our nonprofit partners on, on, on risk and how they can take risk in the social sector and what that means. And the, I'm, I'm actually not there because I'm here, but the, the, the conversation is going to be about developing a culture of risk. How do you, how do you uh, communicate that internally? How do you communicate that with your board? And how do you communicate, most importantly, about the need to take risks, the need to, the need to be experimental with your funders. Um, people are very comfortable with for-profit entities taking risks, making pivots, looking at current data, learning, growing, modifying, 
they are not that comfortable with nonprofits doing that. And part of that is we need to change that culturally in the, in the community so they do accept a, a level of, of smart, intelligent risk-taking to achieve goals. But we also need to tell it in the way or change it in the culture of our, uh, philanthropy and nonprofits in the way that we tell our stories and the way that we talk about what we are trying to do and that it is, if we are being an authentic learning organization, we, we do need to pivot when we get that information. We don't need to just respond directly. So that, that's a short answer. I know we're short on time, but that, that's what the focus of the workshop is today. Great. Thanks very much. Um, so I'm going to use the moderator's prerogative here and ask a question to Valerie that I'm curious about. So, uh, so you know, I'm, you, you all have, have moved as you were talking uh, in your, in, at, toward the end, especially of what you presented about moving into um, using the in, invested um, endowment in order to advance the mission and values of the family and of the foundation, um, and, and, in, and in other ways using sort of market tools, if you will, uh, you, you mentioned proxy voting is something else that you all do. Uh, you know, how do those? You, if you want to talk a little bit more about why those are important to you, and maybe even how they fit with the the use of the market, frankly, by the family historically to really create the wealth in a, in a positive way. And I know that you know John D. Rockefeller Sr. had a view that the the best philanthropy you could um, advance is to give somebody a job and advance uh, their their own success through the marketplace. So. Uh, maybe how legacy informs your use of these market tools now in the current family. No, you're absolutely right to frame it that way because just as for him, making money was in the service of God. There is a consistency there. I think now um, in our family there's a growing belief, and certainly at the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, that you sh you could be making money and doing good at the same time. And we'd already already in our climate change work, we have alliances that might be somewhat unexpected. I mean, there are a lot of faith communities and there are a lot of libertarians and there are others who are really interested in energy independence, renewable energy, climate change. You know, there's a lot of work that's happening in the military in terms of, you know, climate change as a national security threat. So this is one of those areas where you may have um, what may seem like unlikely partners until you think through it and see, actually, we do have, we do have consistent goals, right, which are that you need to look at science, you need to look at data, and then you need to make the best investments and do the best philanthropy moving forward to achieve this sort of goal, you know, the sort of world that we want to be in. And frankly, there's, you know, we had great timing because the price of oil sort of crashed after <laughs> we decided to divest, which was fortuitous. But we think long term, there are a lot of investors who are looking at the risks of fossil fuels. And even if the current administration is not promoting regulation, um, environmental regulation, certainly future administrations will, and that's just the way the world has to, to move to not use up our carbon budget. So there don't need to be these either-ors that I think some of us have just fallen, fallen into and that we do need the private sector to be involved too. One way, I mean, we do get some pushback on the divestment piece of it because absolutely it's right that someone else is just going to buy those shares right now. We don't think they should, even if you're not worried about the environment, just there's a lot of uh, financial risk and there's even fiduciary risk, we think, in investing in fossil fuels at this point. But another way, if you do end up holding on to your shares, and again, not just looking at the environment, but you look at corporate governance issues, you look at um, sort of community engagement issues, what type of company do you want to be, one way you can help drive that change is by voting your proxies. So when we, when we moved to a, to a chief investment office outside of the fund in late 2007, then we lost the ability to vote our proxies, which is something that we had been looking at before that and, and working on before that, because then we're in commingled funds. When we switched OCOs, we were then able to, have, um, to exercise our proxy voting rights. We see this, by the way, as part of our democratic practice grant making, that just as you know, citizens need to use the power of the vote and engagement that they have, investors need to use the power that they have by voting proxies. Um, so there, there are different services that you can sign 
on to, to to have this type of engagement. So again, it's it's making investments that are wise for the future, and it's being an active investor to have, you know, to be in, to be supporting companies and to creating the change that you want to have. So I feel like I've lost the thread of your original question there, but the, this being deeply engaged in your businesses and really taking sort of personal ownership of your investments is um, sort of gives authenticity. I also have to say back to the question that Kelly was addressing about engaging younger members of the family. There, are, there is so much more interest in the work of the RBF from the youngest family members once we did this divestment and did this aligning our um, grant making with our you know, endowment management, because this is something that just makes a lot of sense to, to younger, <laughs> younger people, millennials, because I think that they have, um, to way overgeneralize, more buy-in to this sort of authentic life and not having trade-offs between your per professional and your personal decisions. Thanks for that, Valerie. I'm really glad you brought up the next generation of millennials and, and giving families, of course. Uh, you know my interest in that subject. Uh, so we, uh, I apologize to those. There's been some other questions asked, but we're not going to be able to get to them. Um, I, because we want to allow a few minutes here at the end um, and still in, finish on time uh, for each of the uh, panelists to give some final thoughts and sort of final takeaways specifically. So if, if, if all three of the panelists could, could offer a few thoughts um, just very quick takeaway thoughts on, um, for those who are in the audience, uh, many of them of course are facing this perennial challenge of honoring legacy while also adapting and providing and expanding current impact. Um, so what would be your primary takeaway advice uh, for those folks who are, who are uh, facing and trying to tackle this challenge themselves? What, what should they be careful about? What should they be, what can they be bold about? What's the primary lesson that you would give to them? So let's uh, go, Kelly, uh, have you go first. All right, I have uh, three things. One is, uh, you know, th this notion around intergenerational conversations. I think we often think of, okay, it's time to pass the baton to the next generation. Um, I, and I'm kind of trying to pause that a little bit and say to families, you know, let's think about actually nurturing and, and cultivating conversations between the generations right now. Um, I think the next gen, we need to learn about them. They're thinking. Uh, Michael's book, Re, uh, The Generation Impact, has helped me a ton in kind of deepening my knowledge and having a better understanding. But I also think there's stuff that the older gens pass along, uh, particularly around the legacy piece and the values piece that is essential to kind of capture. Um, and this piece around having a legacy statement. If your donor is living and you have that opportunity like Rick, Rick really illuminated, do that. It's really critical. It grounds you. It grounds the family. And if you don't have it, if, you, if the donor is no longer living, consider other ways to discover it like I did. Look, look for artifacts, writing, and so on, and, and have conversations with family. Number two, um, don't be careful. This is the caution part. Be careful not to take for granted your family and your foundation's culture. And what I mean by that is that culture and dynamics and connection and values, they can shift over time. They can be impacted by out external factors. So revisit those, tend to it, make time on your agendas to, to examine and have time for connection and check-ins and retreats and so forth. Really important, really important. And then finally, be bold. Be bold about identifying what is really needed for systemic change and impact. So be bold and go beyond grant making. Really start to look at your, all of the assets that you have, leveraging PRI and MRI and your human capital and communication strategies. Um, be really explicit and bold about language. Language matters in this field. When we named social justice and we named racial equity in our work, it opens up a whole different clarity and pathway and partnership definition um, that follows. And it also names and, and leads to us um, being clear about supporting advocacy and organizing. Don't be afraid of those terms. Get to know and understand the nuances of that kind of work. And then be bold about stepping up for general operating support. It's needed right now more than ever, and, um, and, and you do not sacrifice impact um, by doing that. So those are, my, those are mine. That's a fantastic list, and, uh, and the check is in the mail for the blurb for my book. Thanks a lot, Kelly. <laughs> I know. Uh, it's true, though. It's helped me a lot. <laughs> Appreciate it. Valerie, uh, your final takeaway thought. 
Well, I endorse everything that Kelly said, and I will just add briefly that, you know, adhering to your values consistently can actually spur more innovation because you are on a common starting point. You agree on those things, and then you use those. You can have a tradition of innovation in your family and with your grant making. So as long as you're being very honest with yourself about what you're doing, we spend a lot more time on enterprise risk management conversations than we used to, and we chart it out. And that has been a really interesting process that has allowed us to actually do much um, more risk taking than we used to because we really talk through what's worth it and what's not in terms of risk. And especially I'd say after the election and the shifting political environment, we started one of the bold things we did was allowing a lot more um, staff input into grants so that every member of the foundation, every staff member was able to do more sort of grant making, which was a way that we really channeled some of the emotion around that to become more democratic ourselves. And that's something we were able to do because we had done such a careful assessment of our risk posture. Wonderful. And uh, Rick, you get the last word, final takeaway. Yeah. Uh, finally, and those both of those are great lists for folks. I would I would add I would add these comments. One, stay focused on your overall philanthropic goals. Um, there is a tendency and a, and a desire to to make sure that you're driving your organization based on the individual needs and, and desires. And I would say that that while that has to be adhered to, that we found conversations that that rise up and remind folks of the, the greater philanthropic goals of the family at large have been more successful for us. Um, be open to the structure and the platform that you're using. I, I, I didn't get enough time to go into it, but I think this structure of having the dual platforms of a, a family foundation for the collective good and the individual um, uh, pools of money for the personal passions, ha we believe is going to allow us to stay together and, and have the ongoing types of conversations we want. And then finally, I would add, because um, um, the other lists have been so, so good so far, I would add, add the younger voices as soon as possible. I cannot say enough how helpful it has been to have the fourth generation enter the board. When they say, you know, it, with all love, grants, but have you thought about it this way? The whole meeting takes on a different tenor, and it's allowed us to move in a very different way. So. Um, we have an age of 25. I know some people even go younger than that, but getting those voices in the room um, have been have been absolutely critical. So I'll end with those. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Uh, I, uh, I first, I just want to say um, a, a very, very deep, heartfelt thanks to, uh, to, to Rick and to Valerie and to Kelly for, for doing this webinar. I think it, uh, you all knocked it out of the park, which is the great baseball metaphor now that we're heading baseball season. Um, and, uh, and we're just really, really thankful from the Johnson Center for you to be willing to share your wisdom and your reflections. Um, a couple of final uh, uh, notes here. One is, of course, a reminder that we, um, we will have the next summit uh, in Fort Lauderdale next year. You'll be seeing a lot of information around that. You can always go to johnsoncenter.org to get more information about that. The theme this time will be donor journeys, so there will be a lot of really interesting, helpful stories. Um, to, to take away lessons from there. Um, and then also a few things about the, the webinar. The, there will be a recording available, um, both uh, emailed to participants and available on the johnsoncenter.org website. Um, and also to remind you that there will be an evaluation of this that will pop up when you close um, out the, uh, the ReadyTalk. And, uh, and please, please provide us that feedback so that we can um, improve these and, and provide even more of this content for you going forward in the future. So thanks again to everybody for being here. Thanks especially to our three panelists. And, uh, and we hope you've enjoyed this, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much.